The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Advice Intelligence is the market leader in goals-based advice technology. Offering clients an end-to-end financial planning software solution, AI unleashes the true power of advice by providing a new world of advice software to enable planners to work smarter, not harder. Delivering financial advice in a way that's inspiring, cost-effective and scalable. AI makes it easy for advisors to have enriched and engaged conversations with clients so they can solve their problems and explore future possibilities together. This week, I speak to Andrew Hewison. He's the Managing Director and Partner at Hewison Private Wealth. Now, I'd heard on the grapevine that what this business was doing from a tech perspective was pretty special. And so I wanted to learn, well, what are you doing? Turns out they aren't one to just take an off the shelf piece of technology and build business processes around it. Oh no, 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 quite the opposite. You're going to learn today just exactly how they've created a pretty special tech experience within their business, looking for best of breed technology, which is industry agnostic and learning about how to make sure that any tech that you build in the business is robust. It has your client strategy in mind. And we talk a lot about how does this actually practically work? Who implements it? How much does it cost? And what are the learnings that he had on the way? Enjoy. Hi, Andrew. Jess, how are you? I'm great. I think I'll be better after today's conversation because I think you are going to blow my mind when it comes to all things financial advice and specifically tech. But, 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 before we get way, way into the weeds on this, because you know that I I want to go there and learn all the things, I think it's important that we learn a little bit more about you up front and then, of course, a little bit more about the business. So, Andrew, to kick us off, can you please tell us your story? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, my name's Andrew Hewison. I live in Melbourne in the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the Bayside area, married with uh, three children uh, under four. Oh my gosh, wow. Yes, until tomorrow, the, one of them turns three and then the week after another one turns five. But life life is busy, life is very, very fun. I wouldn't have that any other way. I grew mm-hmm. up down on the Mornington Peninsula, um, like a lot of young young men, very, very sports mad, always mm-hmm. uh, had aspirations of being an AFL footballer, um, fell just a little short there and then decided I was going to go into sport management, um, player management, etc. I did a week's worth of um, work experience there and realised that's the last thing I wanted to do because it was ex-footballers dealing with current footballers, not business people dealing with business people. No offence to any Mm. footballers out there. Um, Mm. But just decided that wasn't what I was going to do and what it wasn't what I wanted to do. And at the same time, my father, John Hewison, who some listeners might know the name, mm. um, he he started uh, Hewison Associates, as it was known back then in around about 1985. So obviously he was building out, you know, well-established and, and, and continued to grow Hewison's. And then I decided, look, I'm doing a commerce degree. I was majoring in marketing and sport management, so nothing financial planning related, but then just decided, look, maybe this is something that I need to have a look at and uh, started work with dad. And after about five minutes, decided that I absolutely loved it. Um, I just loved dealing with people. I love relationships. I love customer service. And Mm -hmm. I can start to see that, you know, this thing called financial planning can actually have 
such a huge impact on people's lives. So um, started the study, post-grad studies almost straight away. Mm -hmm. And the, the degree was finished at, at that stage. I was working in a surf shop, managing a surf shop. was I went basically out of a surf shop straight into a suit working in financial planning. So that's a bit strange. And I still love surfing yeah. today. That's my number one passion and hobby. Um, did a sabbatical nine months in for two, two years overseas and worked for some finance related businesses over there and then came back and uh, I've been in Hewison's um, ever since. I worked as a financial advisor, uh, solely as a financial advisor for 15 years. Mm. Along that journey, I, I purchased equity in the business at the same time as a number of my other current business partners. And then I actually, believe it or not, uh, I actually applied for my father's role as managing director when he indicated he was going to step back about 10 years ago. So that was sourced out to a third party to make that decision. And I was lucky enough to um, to be successful in that role. And I've been the managing director of Hewison Private Wealth for the last eight or so years. Still have my C CFP designation. I still have a, have a small client book. But as the business continues to grow, the majority of my time is taken up um, running the business operationally. Mm -hmm. Surf shop to suit. I love that quote. I think that's very interesting and you can't see him, but he's got a beautiful suit on and he's got, you know, this beautiful background behind him of the cityscape of Melbourne. So um, I can just imagine you in Billabong. Yeah, sure. I, I would prefer that. I would prefer the, the, the background to be a, a wave somewhere and that's, that's, mm. that's the pipe dream one day is perhaps not have the office, um, have the office looking out over the water. That'd be great. But uh, definitely would like my, my living room window to look out over my favourite surf break one day. Love it. So tell me more about the business itself. Okay. How big is it? How many staff you got? You've got a, an interesting investment philosophy. Let's learn more about that. Okay, no problem. So we're an independent financial planning business um, mm -hmm. and we're independently owned and we're independent yep. by the letter of the law as well. We've always been that way. We've always been a, a fee-for-service business. It's something that we are very passionate about and, and mm -hmm. you know, whether it was deliberate or not, you know, the industry going, going around in cycles of consolidation and then fragmentation right now I think is a, is a, it's, it is as good a time as ever to be an independent business or an independently owned business, so an IFA. So we've grown organically over our 38-odd years. We manage... Um, 1.7, thereabouts, 1.7 billion in farm. Mm -hmm. We have the numbers always moving, but we've we've got somewhere between 50 to 55 staff. We've actually been growing our offshore component quite a bit recently. We've had one or two offshore staff members for a few years now, and I think yeah. it's very much the same story as everyone else. It's a topic for another discussion, but you have one. It breaks down a whole lot of barriers and perhaps perceptions you might have had. You realise the calibre of the people and it's not about saving money anymore. It's also about, about productivity. And we've just been growing out that component over the last few years as well. Interesting. Where are they based before we move on? KL and the Philippines. Cool. Okay. And then your Australian team, are they mainly Melbourne? Yeah, so we've only got a Melbourne, but well, we're, we're a Melbourne-based business. We've only got, yep. got one office. We've got one our SMSF manager works in Sydney. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, remote, but remote can mean anywhere. It doesn't have to mean overseas as well. It's just trying to, trying to get the best talent um, mm. for, 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 the, for the roles that you're looking for. Um, you know, we're, we're not afraid to look at people that don't work in the Hewison office, but we're on St Kilda Road, uh, 417 St Kilda Road here um, in Melbourne. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, and so, look, I mean, I'm happy to sort of just to keep rolling with it. And in terms of, you know, you mentioned that investment philosophy. And look, the thing I'd say from the outset is, and I'm going to talk about what we believe in a philosophical sense uh, is the right structure and the right philosophy to for us to be able to produce the best outcomes for clients. But I totally appreciate that there are, it's not the only way. It is, mm. it is one way and everyone else yeah. is doing it the way... Um, that, that they, they believe works for them and their clients, and I totally respect that. So in a nutshell, Jess, we've never, we've never used risk profiling. 
we certainly have a very robust fact find which which asks some detailed risk related questions but it's very simple as a as a you know we've always called it objective based advice and i know probably amp came out a few years ago and coined the phrase goals based advice and i get that that's all the same sort of thing to us but when a client walks through the door and it speaks to also that independent the independence that we that we hold on to when a client walks through the door and sits in front of us and we're we're asking all the questions about who they are what they what they're looking to achieve what are their goals and aspirations we want to listen to that and then we want to put together a, a strategy mm-hmm. and an investment piece to that strategy which we believe is going to be entirely in their best interests and entirely appropriate to achieve their goals and objectives. If if they tell us what their goals and objectives are and we ask them to fill out a risk profile and that risk profile puts puts out uh, a risk profile which then feeds into a model portfolio which is not going to actually achieve their goals and objectives, we think we've got a problem. And so we'd rather listen to them, listen to what they need and we're going to obviously get into the weeds of our systems in a minute, but mm. be able to put together a bespoke portfolio with a bespoke asset allocation, which we believe we can then take back to them and say, this is what we think you need that's built for you that's going to achieve your goals and objectives. And if there is an alignment because their goals and objectives are, are more aggressive than we think is is achievable, then that's when the conversation starts around, look, you realise you're going to have to take a great deal of risk, which we don't think we're we're not the right business to put that together because we're actually quite conservative by nature. But but there's a misalignment here between where you need to be and what you're going to need to do to try and get there. Let's start talking about that. Obviously, because you're running a business where you're building bespoke portfolios, there has to be such a level of rigour and visibility and technology, I would imagine, to enable you to do that. This is where I, you know, you and I talked before this podcast and you're doing lots of cool stuff and I could talk to you for a long time, but alas, our fair listeners will not listen to all day podcasts. Maybe we should. Let's try. Um, No, I want to talk really specifically about how you've built this philosophy into the business that exists today, focusing a lot more on the tech piece. But before we get into really what you're doing there. Given that the business is older than I am, you have clearly gone through an enormous amount of evolution. When did you really start to realize that the tech piece could really, I guess, completely change in the business and revolutionize the advice that you're giving? Well, that's, and, and, and just to be very clear too, I think I was five when this business started. So um, I was only just, I was only just born. I've been here for about 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm going to try and, you know, like there, there might well be some gaps along the way, but as you say, you and I are focusing on one aspect of this and, and yeah. if any listeners actually had any further questions, they're more than welcome to send me an email or find me on LinkedIn or something like that. Absolutely. No mm-hmm. problem. Mm-hmm. So you've got to go back in history a little bit. Okay. Um, so Let's my, my, my father who founded the business, um, We've never used a platform, which is mm-hmm. going to be surprising to some people. But back yeah. going going back way when, 1987 stock market crash happened, and um, Dad realised at the time that in his belief, and again I talk about our philosophies not being the only way, but his belief was that at that point in time, most of his clients were in managed funds. Managed funds at that point in time, you know, they were being exited by other unit holders. Some of them were being frozen. What he realised is that his client, his own clients didn't have control and flexibility over their outcomes and over their own destiny. So out of that and soon after, he decided to um, start building portfolios on behalf of his clients that were predominantly direct. And that still is a philosophy that we hold very dearly today. So 90 to 95% of our portfolios would be directly invested. Okay. Um, and so back then, he started administering those portfolios because, again, and I'm going to stop saying this, this is for the last time, because it's not the only way, but our belief back then or his belief back then was that if you're on a platform, you do have restrictions around what you can invest in on behalf of your clients. Um, and so, as has happened, the building that we're in today is a building that our clients have invested in, in a property sense, and there's one across the road that our clients have in. now. 
you can make it work, but I think 99% of advisors out there would be like, well, it's not on a platform, it's not on the platform mm-hmm. that I use, so I can't invest in it. But from our perspective, if we feel like this is in the client's best interests and it's going to get them towards their achieving their goals and objectives, we need to be able to invest in it. So going all the way back there, he was administering portfolios under this roof using spreadsheets. After a few years, he and the small team he had at that point in time realised that there was no other technology out there, whether it was X plan back then or whatever, that that would adequately give them what they what they needed to be able to continue to do that. So they actually went out and built their own. Mm-hmm. So for the next twenty five years, we had our own proprietary piece of software, mm-hmm. um, and that was like our CRM, our workflows, our planning tools, APL. All, all of that, uh, and and we as a business manage over 750 self-managed superannuation funds, and it also did SMSF administration, pension management, contributions, the whole the whole box and dice. So now you you fast forward up till uh, you know around about five years ago, we'd made the decision before that, but five years ago we 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 embarked on. Um, the retirement of that system. Now, mm. it was only officially retired about six months ago, believe it or not, it t- took that long. Yeah, right. Um, because we realised that, look, we tried to tell ourselves at that point, look, we're financial advisors, we're not, we're not tech developers and technology is literally just like a hockey stick. It's just started to, you know, invert and just go to the cloud. So we can't keep up. Mm. So we started looking for alternatives. We looked to rebuild it on our, on our own. Um, we went down the pathway of of a piece of software off the shelf. I won't mention the name because it is a good yep. piece of software. Mm-hmm. Um, we started implementing it. We brought all our client data in. And at the last minute, we realized that there were a couple of key components that we were told the software had and, and could do. And, it, and And in the end, it fell over and it didn't have those components. And that's also a key warning that I will give now and we'll talk about it later is mm. when you're talking to software providers, software software providers, the sales team, in our experience, will tell you things that the system will do, which is, oh, it can do everything. And then you speak to the speak to the technical people behind and they're like, who said they could do that? It can't do that. So mm. that's a that's a bit of a trick for uh, for first time players as well. Um, and so so part of the software that we've we've um, we had developed and 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 now um, We've, and we'll get to the technology stack that we're using now. Um, part of that is the ability to actually be able to create an asset allocation from scratch and then be able to you know, bring in investments that sit on our approved product list mm-hmm. uh, into that asset allocation, um, which then can determine you know, what kind of income that portfolio is going to generate. You know, we, we obviously work on some assumptions around the growth of certain asset classes, which then falls into, you know, a lot of the reporting that we can create for our clients to show them the benefits of, of that asset allocation and that particular strategy. I made a mistake earlier because I thought, ignorantly, given the age of the business, that technology would be a new thing that has been sort of brought into the business and and revolutionized the business. But actually, when I hear your story, fascinatingly, tech has been an enormous part of the journey. And I didn't realize that there was such an early on investment and adoption of bespoke creation of technology. And so you've really built a business where tech has always been in your DNA. Absolutely. And I give, you know, obviously give all the credit to the old man for that. And one of the key pillars of our business is innovation. And we've always felt that our ability to, as an independent business, um, our ability to be able to provide the clients with the best outcome and the best experience and also um, compete with some of our larger competitors and peers in the industry it was mm. always going to have to be around our ability to use technology to run a more efficient business. I always say, uh, and I might have mentioned this to you beforehand, we we are you know a business that actually I would say that not doesn't use managed accounts and doesn't use platforms. We are a very we are a very inefficient business that is operating very efficiently. 
Because mm. I know a lot of people, I've, I've got a lot of, obviously got a lot of friends in the industry and I, I speak to them about how, what we do and how we do it and they just scratch their heads. I mean, we're mm. also, for what it's worth, and this is another topic, but part of our fixed income portfolio and we've got, you know, a very diversified approach to fixed income, but a, a piece of that is the use of um, first secured mortgages. So, uh, and we've been using them for almost 30 years and they're not pooled funds, they're contributory mortgages. So individual mortgages, we vet them, we look at the we look at the valuation, we decide in this office whether or not our clients are individually going to take part. I only bring that up because we we've now we've now been involved across tens of thousands of those mortgages. We're growing, we use seven providers. Um, it's a it's a big job to be able to be able to um, administer that in the background but again when you start small so you're talking to me today after 38 years but when you start something small it's it's manageable and then you know as you continue to grow with greater mm. client numbers and more people you develop your systems and processes over time and so you know you work out how to continue growing it but also to continue doing it relatively efficiently um, and you learn things along the way. So it's not like we just turned up yesterday and decided to put all this together. It would be very difficult, I, I believe, to be able to do that. It's just that we've been doing it for now for so long and we've been mm -hmm. you know, growing nice and slowly along the way. Given the level of inherent complexity in what you do, and we've obviously touched on a, a couple of the points there, <laughs> that leave us, other advisors, thinking, whoa, that sounds interesting. I want you to paint a picture for us in terms of understanding, like, what have you built? Let's talk through, you know, if we can in the short time that we have together, you know, give us a, a high level version of what end to end you've been able to put into the business to enable this level of complexity to be achieved compliant in a highly compliant, highly efficient, highly customer centric way. Okay. What I would Drum say up. is, yeah, that's right. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, and, ho <laughs> and well, I just hope I don't go on too many tangents and confuse everyone. So I'll try and, try and keep it. We're a smart bunch. We're all right. Yeah, no, you that's I appreciate are. that. So, so I think also what I would say too is I was fortunate enough to be some of the some of the the, the listeners out there may uh, may do some things with Macquarie. We we use Macquarie's CMA. That's yeah. all we use from a product point of view. And we're a member of uh, within the Macquarie network. They've got a net. have got a group called Van, the Virtual Advisor Network, which is. Um, Used to be for a small number of advisors, but but I do highly recommend you, you anyone might be interested to look into that because they now do offer it to a broader base of up Macquarie and coming. Will be very happy with that small plug for Van. Well, so I'm well not done, into, you. I'm not. Oh uh, well, you might have heard of it before, but look, we we have actually got a lot out of it, and and I was lucky enough some years ago to 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 go with a, a small group of advisors across to the United States. Yep. Uh, on a on a on a on a, a global innovation tour is what they call it. And it was back then that I started to cotton on to this concept of the the technology stack and the and and the ability to effectively create a hub and spoke model where you house all your 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 data you know somewhere. And for us, we've used Salesforce mm -hmm. in this instance. And then from there, you it's a plug and play. So you pick the best of breed pieces of technology that suit you you and your business and your clients, but if for any one reason something new comes along, you do have the ability to replace a piece of software with another. We, we haven't yet had to do that. Because they have like an app just for those of us who have never used it before. So apart from their sort of core CRM, my understanding is they have almost like a library of different apps that can be plugged into the Salesforce system. So you can plug in and plug out and play. Obviously, there's more complexity, but just so that people who've never used it can understand. That's sort of how it works, right? I wish it was that simple. <laughs> I'm obviously trying to make it as simple as possible okay, because okay, most look, people, look. they won't be used to the – so if, if we use a, a, a um, X plan or an advisor logic as a general example, you know, you need to remember that most financial advisors who use just financial planning software, they're not used to having a library of thousands of different industry agnostic pieces of tech that they can sort of – push into their process yeah so so salesforce is is out of the box mm -hmm. you can't do a lot with salesforce you, you you need to customize it now what i would say is if you're looking to build out your crm 
um, you, 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 you purchase, you know, a, a license to Salesforce, you know, out of the box, and um, they have two different um, two two different instances. Like one they call Marketing Cloud, and the other one is Financial Services Cloud. And I'm not you, you and I will be here all day if I try and and I and, and uh, you know. I'm the pretty face to all this, so to speak. I mean, there's a lot of other people underneath that do a lot of the, the a lot of the grunt work <laughs> that know a lot more of the detail than I do. So, so Salesforce out of the box, you you start to customize it. You, you do need to find a developer. Um, you, you don't have to, you know. Salesforce can be basic, and you can plug you could plug in. Don't know whether you could plug in X Plan, but you can certainly plug in other pieces of off the shelf um, software. But for us, and I'll just sort of try to keep it. Yeah, that's in terms of us. yeah, yeah, yeah. Salesforce is our is our CRM, and it is you know out of our CRM, it is now basically what I would say is it's the it's it's all it's pretty much the equivalent to Xplan. Um, we have our you know our CRM, all our client information in there. We have all of our workflows built out out in there. So if, if I need something, if I need to, a new client comes in, they've signed up, and I need to then start pushing it out to the, back, the, the the ops team, here's what needs to happen. I create what they call a case, and that sets off a chain of workflows that goes throughout the office to to get the client implemented in a, in a broad sense. We've also developed um, the planning tools. So all of our clients that sit in Salesforce they sit in there as a household, which is like basically like if Andrew Hewison has a super fund, a family trust, and a personal portfolio, I'm in there with my family as a household, and then there's portfolios underneath. Mm-hmm. I have the ability to go and create the, the new client, the new household, create the portfolios, and we've, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but okay. what we've yeah. also been able to do now is we've now, rather than craft an asset allocation from scratch um, we've got like five or six suggested asset allocations that you can start with and once mm-hmm. you pick that and you put in your investable amount it will bring in um, the APL into the different areas of the asset class and then you can craft it to decide whether or not the client wants to invest in Woolworths for example that might be on it. I was like no look I don't need so it's not like oh you have to have that portfolio it's not a model um, and you know, there's a compliance piece behind that. We've got now ten advisors. We've we we started with you know three advisors. Then we went to six, and we've been slowly building it out. We have a lot of rigor that goes on um, in the background to ensure that all our clients are educated and skilled enough to be trusted. And again, we're not we don't have fifty authorized reps. We've got ten in one office. We've got a compliance manager. It's there's 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 systems and processes in place to manage that. So you then build out the asset allocation that goes, you know, implements, and then we've now built out rebalance modelling. So I can look at it at a household level. If there's multiple portfolios, I can line those all up. They can we can have a look on one screen. What's what each portfolio has with a master asset allocation at the top. So every time I make a change, it'll either deduct or credit the cash account. Uh, it'll show me what I still need to where I still need to invest at the asset allocation level to rebalance the portfolio. So there's planning tools in there, obviously our APLs in there, and then, which the piece that we actually implemented at the very beginning, whilst we were still building all this out, is the sales the sales funnel, right? So mm-hmm. client makes a phone call, comes in as a lead. It's got some incredible, you know, tools in there that you can that you where you can nurture them see where they're at you can log in all your all your phone calls along the way and then it pushes through to what they call an opportunity and then you've got your own process from there as to where you know where you go until you close off the client as as you know being impl- fully implemented mm-hmm. that's that's one Jess that's so that's the hub right mm-hmm. and then the spoke mm-hmm. uh, class we we don't do accounting but we use class because we needed an investment source of truth and we also needed a piece of software that could also do the appropriate SMSF administration that, that, uh, that we require because we do the SMSF admin, admin internally. Okay. Um, you know, as part of the whole planning process, you, you know, you, you need to be able to manage contributions, you know, concessional, non-concessional, withdrawal recontribution, pension strategies, all that sort of thing. Obviously, you, you know, you get the investment admin at investment admin piece there as well, dividends that are coming in and you know 
the matching technology that that you get corporate actions mm -hmm. uh, you bring in the, the you bring in your the well for us it's the Macquarie CMA you, you bring that in what I would say at this point in time you mentioned apps before in Salesforce now there's an app exchange Mm. which means that if you don't want your developer to go, you don't think, you you know, your developer doesn't want to pay them to go and customise and build out something for you, you go and check the app exchange or they do to find out whether or not the bells and whistles that you're looking for already exist by uh, a third party that sits on the app exchange. So the app exchange is, a, is available in order to minimise the amount of development that needs to take place. So that is definitely a way of, you know, utilizing that and, and saving money to develop it yourself along the way. Mm. But when you're talking about the hub and the spoke, I'm talking about all of the best of breed pieces of software, which which you then have to, and again, it's, it's warts and all. To be, to be honest with you, this is why mm -hmm. there's also money that you've got to invest in. Um, you've got to invest in in the API development, right? So someone, oh, this is the one thing I learned on day one. Anyone that tells you that they've got an API, great what does it do like does it share one piece of data you mm. might need 10 pieces of data and it might need to be a two-way two-way api because it might need to send data into the system and send data back out of the system so just because someone says an api they have an api take it with a grain of salt until you've gone and done more rec uh, more research on on what that api is actually built to do and what have you been able to do through the use of APIs in the business from a tech perspective? So that's where you've got Salesforce and you've got Class. Yep. We've for, we've got a client portal, which we actually did develop ourselves 15 years ago and we rebuilt that on Word, a WordPress platform a few years ago because mm -hmm. we want to keep develop. It's the user experience piece that we want to keep control of and we want to keep developing. And mm -hmm. we see the client portal for us as... You know, class have got a great client portal, but it didn't show the clients what we wanted it to show. And I didn't want to be dictated by a third party as far as what experience I give the client. So the, the, the client portal is something that we, we develop. So there's another piece of software. So we're up to three and I'll, I'll bring it all together mm -hmm. in a minute. Now we're using another piece of really cool technology, which is a relatively new business, new company. It's called Portfolio Cloud. And that's effectively... We use it primarily for advice delivery, but mm -hmm. Portfolio Cloud does have the ability for you, if you don't want to run a platform, you, you, can, um, you can feed, you can put model portfolios into Portfolio Cloud. You can then assign all your clients to whatever those models might be. And mm -hmm. it does actually have the ability for you to review a client, um, press, a, press a button and have it automatically rebalance back to the updated model of whatever sits in that particular model. And that can then automatically generate, you set up the templates in the background with the ROAs and so forth, but you can then press a button and effectively it will generate an ROA with the recommendations that Portfolio Cloud have suggested. Mm -hmm. And you can press another button, send it straight to the client. The client can receive it on their phone, tablet, computer. It can be sent via a text message and an email and they can interactively hit approve on the tablet or double or click approve on, your, on on the mouse and it goes straight back into the system. Now, bearing in mind, we don't use the model portfolio component. I guess you could say, you know, we've got 1,600 portfolios, we've got 1,600 models. So we do it, we still do it individually. And again, huge process development in the background that our planning team, it runs like a well-oiled machine as far as how they do that. But again, that's probably not for today. Mm. That's portfolio cloud. So, you know, five minutes ago, we had PAs and support people, okay, he, here are the recommendations that, that we would like to implement. You physically go and put together the, the, the Word doc, PDF it, send it to the client. The client approves. It goes back into an inbox. Every now and again, one gets missed. Has the market gone up? Has the market gone down? I don't know why, but it always feels like the market goes up and we always have to pay money out because we've missed something. Mm -hmm. um, all of that got automated overnight when you were able to go into the system you do you you know at the moment we do our modeling in Salesforce then we, we plug it into PC sends it out the client approves it and then there's an order you know there's an order log in portfolio cloud of what's come back and approved 
as of like, I think we were chatting like as of two weeks ago, mm. we have now, with and credit to the, 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 the two technology providers, Portfolio Cloud and Open Markets, who are our online trading platform, mm. they, they have now worked together to join their systems so that when the advice comes back in as being approved into Portfolio Cloud, we, we, we don't even have to do this step, but we've got this step at the moment. We actually can just press a button and it will trade automatically. So it's called straight through processing with, with open markets. Now, for 37 and a half years, we were doing this. And when the, 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 the advice came back into our office, our operations team were jumping on to open markets and physically entering all of the buys and sells. And they and did a great job of it manually updating the data to show what the client holds as well. Well, I mean, that's again where you've got over time where you're developing out the APIs. Like we yeah. had we, we had the trading happening in open markets. That would then um, go through to the registry. The registry would overnight or, you know, trade, trade plus two, for example, mm. would go back. That would update the class being the source of truth for investment data. Class would then go and update Salesforce and at the same time update um, Portfolio Cloud and the client portal. So we're relying on the class API to update all the other systems. But again, people are going to make mistakes and the bigger we get, the bigger clients we've got, the bigger the mistakes that get made. And so this straight through processing along with Portfolio Cloud, it's, it's hard to fathom and quantify the amount of time and money that we've saved and the reduction of errors that we've that we've now removed from the automation of all of these systems put together. I feel like you're living in the future. <laughs> it's you know what it's w- when you're living in it, you don't really feel that way. Like I don't, we don't sit around and pat each other on the back and go, "Oh, we how good are we?" We're just trying to. We feel like we're trying to stay stay keep our own heads above water. To be honest. Mm. And when you're in the trenches doing it, I've got to be honest, it is really hard work when you're trying to run a business and also you, you're, bearing, you're bearing this responsibility at the same time. But mm. I guess what I would say without trying to sound too you know, angelic about it all is like they're, they're, we, at a strategy day or at a board meeting or whatever, we might talk for literally 30 seconds about how difficult it is and then, and then it always just reverts back to for in our, in our office, we believe that we have to keep the philosophy can't change as far as how we do things for the clients because we think that's in their best interest. And so we just have to put our heads down and keep trying to work forward um, on, on ways of making it um, as efficient as possible. Well, huge congrats to you. I think anyone that um, has ever tried to integrate any piece of technology into their financial advice business will know all of the complexities that come with. And just hearing that evolution in the tech stack and, and the learnings and, and the failures as well, um, you know, it's definitely sounds to me like a lot of complexity, a lot of thought and a lot of effort has gone into that. But obviously, to your point, you're now able to have a client experience that is hugely on brand for what you've tried to build and wildly efficient and compliant by virtue of the fact that this technology is doing so much of the pieces for you in a way that's fast and correct. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh- and the other thing I'd say about Portfolio Cloud is it is actually a very, very, very good compliance tool as well because when you hit send, yeah. it shows when it goes out, it keeps it keeps a log of when the client opens it, when they approve it, and when it comes back into the system. So it's very difficult for someone to say, oh, well, you didn't send it to me, I didn't get it because yeah. we can kind of see what what's happening. What I, I other thing I just would love to add as we're going along is – Myself, my business partners, senior management, we don't, we don't own this. We don't own the success of, of this. So one of the things that this business has done over the years, we used to have two, now we only have one, but we have an annual staff conference where we close the office for two days and we get off site and we workshop different areas of the business to effectively, how do we improve what we do for the client? Mm-hmm. Um, but as you can imagine, a huge part of this is always technology focused mm. um, or how do we improve the way that we do things in the office to support su- support the technology we're using or vice versa. So, so much of what we have right now 
is the brainchild of all of the people out in our office that are living and breathing it every day. It's not so I just don't want anyone to think that this all happens because of, you know, some of the just the key people in the office whiteboarding it all because at the end of the day, we run, we try to run a very flat hierarchy here. One of our key values internally is empowerment. It's our, our three internal values are fun, family and empowerment. Mm-hmm. They're written all over the walls in the background and we want to empower our staff who are using this um, for good, bad, or indifferent every day. We want to empower them to know that if they've got a better way of doing something and the way that we can improve the system. And then, obviously, I suppose, because we, at this point in time, Jess, surprisingly, believe it or not, we don't have full-time developers doing this. That was going to be my next full- question. I'm like, do you have any dedicated resources to just this or no? No. Mm. No. Now, a couple of points on that. Tell Arguably, me. well... Arguably, we, 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 should, we should have maybe one person. Okay. But, you know, it is, say, it's a bit of a cross to bear. But we do ask, we do ask our staff to maintain an involvement, whether it's championing uh, a, new, a new piece of software, championing, championing a new efficiency within a piece of software, which they've had a hand in. So, you know, they, they then take on the responsibility of meeting with the developers that we work with developing the statement of, of, of works, user acceptance testing, saying what they do and don't like about it. We try to share that around quite a bit because obviously they've got a day job to do as well. Mm. We haven't really had, like most people really embrace it because they see, they see that they, they're having an impact and their voices are being heard, um, which is going to improve their own experience day to day. But if I could just keep going on that point, where we are at today we had an operations manager who I would say at least 50% of his time was involved with managing our, our developer or develop mm-hmm. developers because we've got a Salesforce developer who's independent, mm-hmm. but you know, we, we've obviously customized class is not, you can't really customize class too much. They're a bit of a big, bigger beast and won't say much about that. They just, you just, you know, hard to impact. Yep. Um, but portfolio cloud being, being a smaller uh, independent um, tech developer and for provider of software being great with customizing their system for us. And so we've had, you know, an operations manager internally who's sort of managed that. And one of my business partners, Simon, uh, you know, as a partner, he sort of oversees the area of systems. I mean, we all grow up obtaining and increasing the level of IP that we have along the way. Um, but we now our operations manager departed it some months ago and we've now just hired a chief operating officer mm-hmm. um, who will now take over at this point in time, take over the the overseeing of any, you know, additional developments or projects we've got going. Mm. But one thing I learned recently, probably should have learned it a lot earlier, but that's fine, mm-hmm. is that I knew for the period of time when we we're looking to replace our ops manager with a COO that a lot of this stuff was going to fall on my shoulders and I just didn't have the time. And I was put in touch with, with a, a technology um, consultant or project manager and I sometimes feel like um, you start talking about consulting and start, people start getting quite concerned about what it's going to cost. And I actually want to give them a shout out because I feel so, so passionate about the work they do for us. There's a, a group out of um, Brisbane called Level Up Consulting. Mm-hmm. Jasmine O'Reilly is the principal there. Right. And they have been an absolute game changer for us. So they they are now, um, even though you know they're a consultant, but they are now essentially the manager of all of our projects, and their fees are not not exorbitant. They've actually saved us so much money because they've come in and they've looked at whether it's some of the agreements we might have in place or don't have in place at this point in time, and they're mm-hmm. questioning and holding people accountable and. I think when you've got people that are professionals in the area de- dealing with other professionals, um, some of our some of our uh, software developers and and partners probably don't love Jasmine all that much these days because she now holds them accountable because she it's like a mechanic talking to another mechanic. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know what's going on underneath the bonnet of my car. Yeah. And I'm not saying anyone's being dishonest, but if I don't ask the right questions, sometimes I don't get the right answers, and so. Again, there is an ability to use 
consultants and third parties to, to manage these relationships without feeling like you've got to do that all yourself. I think that that's such an, an interesting and important point to sort of pause on because as people are listening to this, it's very evident that you've got a lot of tech that's doing a lot of cool things and it's been a long process to evolve it to what it is today and you've got a big team that can share the load. But when you've got a small business and you're hearing about all the cool stuff you're doing, I think it would be quite easy for some people listening to go, there's no way that I can build anything close to this. I don't understand it. I'm busy seeing clients. We don't have the time, expertise or or, um, or resources. But as you've said, hello, there's a whole field of people who specialize in this. I mean, ironically, we believe in specialization. That's why we have businesses where people come to us to get our expertise. We need to remember that that exists for other people as well. And it's great to hear that you've had such success and such confidence. It sounds like you've got such an enormous amount of confidence in someone externally managing that process for you um, so that everyone can realize that they're not alone and that people out there do exist to help them along the way. And and look, just to simplify it a little bit too, I mean, I think the message, one of the messages I'd, I'd love to share today is mm-hmm. that I'm not suggesting that everyone should run away from platforms, but I think a lot of people feel like they are beholden to one system. And I think we all know which system that is. If I the numbers are correct, I think 85% of the industry will use one, one particular piece of software. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, I think even just, you know, you know, and I'm not suggesting people run out and use Salesforce either. I think there are there are other um, CRM yeah. pieces of software out there, whether it's HubSpot or yeah. whatever it might be, but even Salesforce in a really simple form. But these technologies, they do all talk to each other, you know. So, you know, the ability to use, for example, Portfolio Cloud for your advice delivery um, and, and have that speak to speak to the platform that you use you know, obviously we've purpose built our, our, our client portal. But I just think my, my point is that you don't have to have the same business model as Hewison Private Wealth. You can run your own business model, but also understand that you are no longer beholden to any one system. There are so many other pieces of software out there now. And that if you get the integration piece right, what I am hearing from you is the efficiency gain for your team is enormous. The client time in terms of you know, the reactivity. I mean, the fact that you can have a client sign something and it can be almost executed immediately and the data from once that happens then automatically goes back into those systems. Like this is super cool what you've built. Um, I think it gives us a lot of hope that there is or offers an alternate. Perhaps we'll put it like that. Yeah. Not with an alternate to yeah. what we're used to. There's a couple of really specific questions I want to get to before we finish today's chat though because as you can all probably hear, we could go for days because I have many more questions. Um, I want to know cost. I know that's hard, but like, what's that looked like for you? And uh, it's a bloody good question. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and look, I've always tried to keep it uh, more so as a percentage of revenue. Okay. Um, and so there'll be some years where, you know, I guess when you're heavily investing, it can... Mm creep up to seven to ten percent of um of revenue but um we try and keep it at five percent and it's sort of sitting at about that now and is that total tech spend including developers is that including ongoing licenses of using the tech it is okay it is absolutely um Mm -hmm. once you've done the initial development and look what i would say to that point and i'm not dodging the question the truth is we've been doing it for so long jess that i can't tell you yeah oh that that costs this amount because Salesforce, for example, for us is going to it'll be it'll be endless because I go back to you know when we decided to move away from our proprietary software and we said oh we're not we're not developers and then after five minutes of of of, of you know picking the off the off the shelf software and after five minutes of trying to tell them everything we wanted to do with it and how it had to do this and how it had to do that we just realised oh no we are we actually are technology developers here so let's not try and ignore it how do we mm-hmm. actually embrace it. Hmm. You set a budget for what you can cope with and what you're willing to spend, and you just pick off what are the highest what are the highest payoff activities you need to see from hmm. the customization of the software, and then from there, once you've sort of done that, it then comes down to you know the license the license fees because Portfolio Cloud, Class, Salesforce they all they all have a per user license hmm. fee, hmm. and but look, 
my understanding of understanding the market relatively well is that is that some of the proprietary or some of the software sorry that others are using is not cheap and so um i, I do believe that it is all it is all manageable one okay. thing i'd say you know that i the, the api development has always been a frustration for me because we 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 are of a more mature size but we're still an ifa like like everyone else and you go into these people like oh, i'd love these two systems to talk to each other well surely class is going to pay for that uh you know because once we've built it that's something that could be used if you've developed it you could use that for everyone else and again that's where you start to learn more things about the apis is like the data specifically that you want in your business to come from class or to go to class as soon as that is a bit different to another another one another business you're you're out 20 you know it's 20 grand to pay for the api development so i do wish and, and we've, we did try you know with a few businesses that are close to us what if a couple of ifas came together and shared the cost and if you know of another business out there that is extremely similar to yours by all means you should be going and having that conversation because it's if you mm. can share the cost mm then you can tell straight off the bat, you know, if it's $50,000, for example, and you can share that with another business, you've just, yeah. you've literally just halved it because you yeah. can, you can share that. It's the license fees that you obviously you can't share. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I could talk to you for a long time. Uh, you've given us, I was going to ask you all the things that you've done that haven't worked. I think we've learned a lot about <laughs> salespeople uh, versus actual tech engineers. Um, and, and there's probably some very good wise words of advice there around actually getting the, the back-end experts to show you exactly what it does and doesn't do. You've obviously talked about two-way API integrations or learning about exactly what is and isn't integrated. Is there any other piece of advice or lessons from some of the things that didn't work entirely well for you on your journey you would want to share? The scoping process just just becomes so, so important. And <laughs> I, I do believe now if I had have had a level up consulting in my corner, when we were doing some of the things early on, we would have, they would have understood which questions to ask um, and at what point. Mm. And you can't have too many demonstrations and you need to challenge. You need to challenge and ask questions that, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid if it's too challenging for, for the people that you're talking to because it's a massive decision. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, it is time consuming. Don't, don't get me wrong on that. Like it, it really is, unless you do have, a dedicated resource internally, um, um, but it is time consuming for those those people in, in the office. But if you believe strongly enough in it, then, you know, that's why we've continued to push forward. Everything takes longer, everything. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking to businesses that are the same size as you or you go and talk to some of the large product partners that you've got, like technology always takes longer. And sometimes board, boards and stakeholders don't always understand that mm. oh, what, why wasn't it built on time and on budget? You must have done something wrong. Mm. Even the biggest players in the world, they'll all tell you the same thing that you know that things do always take longer. Yeah, look, I think that's about it as far as the challenge. Um, yeah, the challenges. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. Um, we've run out of time, which is so sad because it's very evident that what you've built is really cool and very interesting and continually evolving, and therefore this becomes an ongoing conversation that we should be having. But before we wrap up, can I ask you a couple of quick rapid-fire questions? These are questions that I ask all of our guests. Love to. Let's go. Uh, I want to know one thing that you do that looks after your mental health. I've got a few because I, I see this as being so incredibly important in mm -hmm. such a busy life that okay. as we go on in life, whether it's business, family, friends, self, there are so many people pulling pulling at you and it's very easy for your cup to get empty really quickly. And what you need to realise is that if, if your cup's empty, then you can't expect to be filling up everyone else's. And I think that's probably where most people wind up in a bit of a state. Yeah. Um, exercise for me is my number one mental health, you know, alleviator. Um, okay. I've, I've just always exercised. Since I was young and I am very passionate about health and well-being mm -hmm. and I just, if I can get up in the morning when no one else is around and no one else is awake and get that out of the way, it's mm -hmm. just something that no one else can take away from me and the mm -hmm. day can go crazy from there, but at least I've got that in the bank. Um, I, do, mm -hmm. I do try to meditate um, and just... 
you know, there's a, I think there's still a stigma with the word meditation, but it's literally just sitting and being present in a given moment mm-hmm. without any distractions mm-hmm. and just trying to focus on one thing, whether it's your breath or, or whatever it is. If, mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't do it every day. I wish I wish I did, but I just, I do focus on that. I've, oh. got, a, I've got a sauna at home, which I think I double. I double with my, if you want to call that meditation as well. Um, big believer in, yeah, I'm a big believer in hot cold therapy, but I've just, I've got a, I've got a sauna at home, which I love getting in and just having, you know, 15 minutes chilling out. Good on you. That's amazing. I went to the infrared sauna last night. I'm a big believer in them as well. Alas, I do not have one in my house. <laughs> a good investment, a good investment. <laughs> do you have any advice for younger Andrew? What's a piece of advice you would give to him? The advice I'd give to younger Andrew would be there are no shortcuts. In life, there are no shortcuts. If you take a shortcut, you're probably gambling on something, which means the stakes are high. Mm -hmm. And one out of 10 times, it might pay off, but nine out of 10 times is probably going to mean you're not going to be around to have the the one out of 10. Um, So put a plan, like whatever you want to do, whatever you want to achieve, it doesn't have to be wealth creation, although that is obviously a good example, but it could be physical or mental fitness or whatever goal you might have is that put a plan in place and start working hard because hard work, hard work is ultimately what has seen me succeed to wherever I am today and whatever I've done. Beautiful. And I would say from an investment perspective, I do actually wish I had of saved a bit of a bit of cash uh you know at an earlier age and 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 put it into something and really um experience the beauty of compounding returns over time because mm. at the age of 42 if I had have done something when I was you know 18 or 20 years of age and just sat it there and forgot about it mm. you know I'd be pretty happy with what I've with what I would have today so I've started that a bit later so again I'll be instilling that into my kids mm. um a lot of a lot of these things I've got three kids so a lot of these things I'll be instilling into them at a younger age yeah awesome uh, do you have something that's on your bucket list surviving the next five years with three young kids <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm accepting that um no, no, look, i got one I, I, I before we had kids my wife joe and i we bought a piece of land in lombok which is the island next door to bali and oh, yeah. the idea yeah the idea was to build a villa on that and spend as much time as we could you know we couldn't afford a cliff top in noosa so we we, we, we settled for a, a cliff top in um in Lombok we now have three kids that villa is now built I've never seen it because it got built during COVID so my bucket list is in the next 12 months is to get all all of us over there and experience that for the first time oh my gosh that's amazing that's very exciting uh last one for you I have a fake book club do you have a book recommendation for me to put on my fake book club list I do Mm mm-hmm have you ever heard of a book called Legacy? Oh, uh, my is... gosh. Is this the one? <laughs> this bloody book keeps coming up over and over again. Is it about the All Blacks? It, it certainly is. You're the third uh, it... person on this podcast. And I can't tell if it's because um, I podcast with a lot of um, lovely gentlemen who like football or if it's just a really, really great book or both. Well, I have no interest in rugby union, so I'll put that straight out mm-hmm. there. I'm a Melbourneian, remember, so yeah. – but – but I, I, I learned so much about business in that book. They are, they are the most successful sporting business in history. And the cultural pieces around it and the thing that I talk quite consistently in our office, which I love, I would love to share as a parting comment, the concept of sweeping the sheds. So no, no task is above an all black. Mm. And so they will get in and they will clean up after themselves and they will sweep sweep the change rooms after they – and this is the most successful sporting team the world's ever known. Mm. And nothing – and you, 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 you take that message out to your team in your office and you're going to start with the – you're going to start with the bones of a pretty, pretty good culture. For everyone else who has heard this recommendation several times and hasn't yet read it, this is our universal sign that we must all go and get Legacy and read it because clearly it's offering some phenomenal insights. Hey, 
We've covered so much ground today. We've gone for a little bit longer than we normally do. So thank you to you for allowing me to um, to drill deeper and also to our listeners for listening for a little bit extra. But I think it was worth it because it's very evident that, as I said, you've got tech in your DNA. You've built a business that continually disrupts and evolves what tech you've got in play with the core philosophy of keeping your clients best just to best interest in mind. So an enormous thank you for your time. Congratulations to you and your team on what you've built. And thank you so much for being part of the XY Community Podcast today. Uh, Absolute pleasure, Jess. And as I said earlier, if anyone had any questions for Mm. me, um, follow on, whether it's this piece of what we talked about or anything else, um, I'm I'm out there on social media. I'm on um, LinkedIn and Instagram, both and just Andrew Hewison. Send me a message on either platform. And all my email, my, my email address is also just andrew at hewison.com.au. If anyone wanted to say hi and ask me a question, I'm happy to answer it. Gosh, we're a collaborative bunch. I love that. Thank you, sir. Congrats again. And I hope everyone enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks, Jess.